Allie, thanks. That's one of the best introductions that I've had, and I appreciate the fact that you took the time to get to know my bio. I, we are very proud of you. And we have hundreds of St. Thomas graduates throughout the Cargill world. We're very happy and proud of our affiliation with your great institution. And I also want to say thanks to Julie. As she mentioned, we started talking about this two years ago. But she is a great leader for St. Thomas and a great leader for our community. We are really lucky and fortunate to have you here. So thank you for all you're doing, not only for St. Thomas, but for the Minneapolis-St. Paul community. And it's a pleasure and an honor to know you and to be here today. I want to spend a few minutes, and there's so much going on in the world of Cargill, but it's certainly in the world around us. And I am so fortunate to have the job that I have and get to see and experience the things that I do in my job. This has been an amazing week. I w appeared before the Minnesota Senate to talk about the business climate in Minnesota on Monday. I testified before the House on Wednesday in the Infrastructure and Transportation Committee, uh, which I was a little nervous about, but it was, it, was, it was good and it went well. And we had an article on Cargill about leadership in the Wall Street Journal yesterday. But this is the highlight. This is the, the peak of the week. Uh, I've been, I've had, I'm feeling a little overexposed in terms of publicity. I'm not used to that as a private company, but it's a, it's a great opportunity for us to tell our story, and that's exactly what I'm going to have the chance to do today. What I'd like to do is give you a little snapshot about our business. I think in the Twin Cities, people know who Cargill is a little bit, but I've got a few details I want to share. I want to talk about the current landscape of the businesses that we're in, the industries where we work. And I want to talk about some important priorities that will help us with the future of feeding the planet, of nourishing the world, and helping us achieve our mission, which is to be the leader in nourishing the world in a safe, responsible, and sustainable way. We play an important role in the global food system and keeping it going, and I'm proud of it, and I'm proud of our 151-year history. This is the ultimate nightmare for Deanna and myself on the slides, and we talked about this this morning. Okay. Pause for awkward silence and pray to God. The same God we prayed to before lunch, I just prayed to to let the slides work. And I think Deanna did too. She is also a graduate of St. Thomas. You can see a little bit about our company. We have 150,000 employees around the world in 70 different countries. If you add in 100,000 contractors, there's about a quarter million people on any given day. Cargill never sleeps. We were founded in 1865. We basically work with small farmers, with large-scale farmers to move, to source, and to make food around the world. Our annual revenues are over $100 billion and our profits on those revenues are over $2 billion. That being said, we're not a household name. First of all, we're family owned. The Cargill and McMillan families have owned this company for 151 years. It's also because we're a business to business company. We make ingredients, we have some branded goods, but basically our job is to manage the world's supply chain. Okay, good, that one worked, we're good. <laughs> So look quickly at our integrated supply chains. What, what really differentiates Cargill from other food and ag companies is our global reach. So we're involved in animal nutrition, we're involved in farm to fork products like meat, like turkey, like a meal that feeds animals that we then consume. We take agricultural and food uh, from the farmers and producers around the world, we store it, we sometimes add value to it, further process it, uh, add flavoring to it, cook it, whatever it may be, and then deliver it to our customers who then sell it in restaurants, in grocery stores that you visit every day. I can't prove it, but I think it's probably safe to say that on any given day, you will have consumed a product that Cargill was involved in the supply chain or manufactured one of the food ingredients. These are some of our strategic customers. These are names that you will recognize and hopefully do recognize. So for example, if you go to McDonald's and have an Egg McMuffin, that's our egg. Anywhere in North America, that comes from Cargill. We supply Dannon and Abbott with ingredients that they make with their powdered baby formula. We also make bio-based products. For example, starch-based products that replace petroleum-based products that go into cosmetics or go into asphalt or um, insulation as a replacement for a binder. 
And then finally, one of my favorite products is Kettle One Vodka. <laughs> I don't often drink vodka, but when I do, it's Kettle One, and that is a Cargill product made at our wheat plant in Amsterdam, Holland, that can make ethanol or can make vodka. You could say there's a very fine line between the two. So if I don't put in a pitch for a Cargill product, who will? But that is one of our, our products. It's not our brand, but it is our alcohol. So let me talk a little bit about the current landscape of food. And as you see, it is very personal. Food has become more personal today than it ever has before. Much like identity politics, people are increasingly identifying themselves by the food they eat. They think about, am I vegan or organic or am I a meat eater? But it is very much and increasingly so becoming part of the national, people's personal and national identity. People want to feel connected to the food they eat. They want to trust where it came from. And they don't anymore just automatically trust a brand. In the past, you look at a label, you think it's Nestle or Coca-Cola. I trust them. I look at their advertisements and I know who they are. But that's not the case anymore. Now it's, OK, I know that brand. What's in it? Who made those ingredients? What kind of company are they? Are they ethical? How do they treat animals? How do they treat the environment? It's so much more complicated, the world of food and agriculture today. So the implications for Cargill are very clear. We make and deliver a wide range of products and solutions. We offer choices like um, food that contains genetically modified organisms, GMOs. We also make food that has non-GMOs. We are striving to be more transparent and to be more public and to allow to get people to know who we are so that they can increase their own identity with the food that they eat but also have greater trust in the overall food system. This is our legacy, but most importantly, this is the future for our company. So while the story of food today is very personal, it's also extremely global. Nourishing the world in a safe, responsible, and sustainable way, our statement of purpose, is one of the biggest challenges for our company today, but also for this generation of people in this room. It means going from an era when resources seem unlimited to, when, to an era where they are definitely constrained. According to the World Wildlife Fund, for example, we, the Earth consumes, we, the consumers of the planet, consume 60% greater natural resources than currently exist. This means we're draining our resources at a rate faster than where we, we are replenishing them. And as the world becomes more efficient, and as populations grow, we have to accommodate more people at the dinner table. By 2050, today's St. Thomas seniors will be at about the same point in their career that I am today. And in 2050, there will be an additional 2 billion people on the planet. We've got about 7 billion people in the world today. It's projected we'll have 9 billion by 2050. So we have to nourish today's generation. We have to get them food but we also have to protect the ability of future generations of Tommies and Johnnies and everybody else to nourish the world in the future. <laughs> I thought I might get a reaction out of that one. So let me give you an example of how Cargill is working to nourish people and protect the planet. In the early 2000s, so about 15 years ago, some environmental groups started um, creating publicity and started talking about how soybean production was contributing to deforestation in the Amazon basin. Global nonprofits and other NGOs, non-governmental organizations, began calling on companies like Cargill to do more to end deforestation and for, by stopping purchases from farmers in the Amazon who were newly deforesting the Amazon to grow soybeans. We have and had then a port terminal right near the Amazon River, so we found ourselves right at the intersection of a very public battle. This was a turning point for us. It was a very public moment and, a, and an inflection point in the way we thought about our business and our business model. And we asked ourselves, okay, by being in the Amazon, by being in the soy production chain, were we contributing to deforestation in the Amazon, and if we wanted to help turn things around, who do we need to work with, what do we do? 
So we joined with some unlikely partners and frankly some entities that really didn't like us very much, some of our strongest critics, and we saw through their eyes our impact and found a path forward. So at the time we had existing partnerships with the Nature Conservancy and Greenpeace, some of our customers and even some of our competitors, and we came together to say we are going to impose a voluntary ban on purchasing soybeans from land that has been newly deforested in the, in the Amazon. So during that first two year period, the soy moratorium, we worked with the Brazilian government to strengthen regulation and to create a new satellite imaging system so that we could monitor it. The work was so successful that the moratorium was renewed and the monitoring system was taken over by the Brazilian government. The moratorium contributed to an 80% reduction in deforestation in the Amazon while farmers went on to increase their productivity. We just celebrated the 10-year anniversary of it and saw it extended indefinitely. So this is what's possible when you work with unlikely partners. Some of you might be thinking, well, that's great, but today's world doesn't really think, feel like a world of collaboration and trust and interaction across different constituents and across different stakeholders. And you're right, geopolitics are shifting and we're standing at a crossroads of some really important issues for business and for society. A lot of these headlines impact Cargill and our business, our community, but also our ability to build a resilient food system. So let me focus on three priorities which we think, which I think, are critical to ensuring a more promising future. So I'd like to talk about advancing innovation, trade, and immigration, some topics that have been very much in the news recently. Advancing innovation. So to ensure a promising future, we have to continue to invest in food innovation. Constrained resources, as I mentioned, means we'll need to produce more food more efficiently in the years ahead. At Cargill, we know the demand for meat, animal protein, is going to continue to grow but we're also looking at alternative forms of protein. So that's why last year we launched a new protein made from peas. This product offers a number of different advantages. First, it can be used in a wide variety of foods from bakery and snacks to beverages and meats. It's sustainably grown right here in North America and it's a rotation crop. It's not one of the big eight allergens it's vegan, it's organic, it's gluten-free, and it's inherently non-GMO. So an alternative source of protein that we've been focusing on developing and bringing to market. These and other homegrown kinds of innovation will continue to keep the state of Minnesota and our country very competitive. So let's talk about trade as another way we'll stay competitive. Cargill supports an inclusive and open trade policy. Globally, we're seeing some concerning trends. It will come as no news that we're seeing more nationalism and protectionism as it relates to trade. Compared to 10 years ago, non-tariff barriers to trade have increased 2.5 times. Complaints raised by the WTO, the World Trade Organization, have been risen about the same amount of over that same time period. When it comes to U.S. trade policy, let me be clear, we want to work productively and effectively with the U.S. Congress and the new Trump administration. And as we do that, we'll make it clear, our viewpoint, that trade is good for the country, it's good for jobs, it's good for the world. 96% of the world's consumers live outside the U.S. We can't wall ourselves off from that. Inclusive trade Amer uh, agreements give American farmers and manufacturers better access to sell into markets that would otherwise face high barriers and high tariffs. For example, since NAFTA was implemented, U.S. agricultural exports to Mexico and Canada have quadrupled from $9 billion in 1983 to $39 billion in 2015. And U.S. leadership on trade agreements has allowed us to develop strong rules for intellectual property, labor protection, and the environment. The benefits of trade go both ways and have huge impacts on the bottom line, namely the cost of food, to consumers. Inclusive trade is also good for the rest of the world. Trade has lifted tens of millions of people out of poverty in the last few decades, and we have seen 
We know from history what happens when protectionism disrupts the flow of food. It can provoke famine, it can causes conflict, and it can even lead to war. We know the need to drive inclusive economic growth. It's a lesson we've all learned very clearly in the last couple of years. We need to be mindful of the impact on jobs and the impact of trade on jobs in local communities, but it's not an all or nothing approach. If the U.S. steps back from our leadership role in the global economy, I can guarantee you other countries will very, very quickly fill the gap. Let me talk about immigration and its impact on jobs. As we work to stay competitive and build a promising future, we have to focus on immigration. This chart from the Wharton School Policy Simulator shows that an increase in legal immigration doesn't take jobs away, it actually creates more jobs by strengthening the overall economy. As workers across the U.S. get older, my generation, the baby boomers, are aging, we need to replace workers and supplement, complement the American workforce with legal immigration. It's never been more important than it has, is today. And this is true of all types of workers. It's not just factory workers. It's also intellectual property workers, PhDs, and the like. As we look to strengthen our immigration system, there's a few things that we think will help ensure a promising future. We have to turn the tide on some of the current themes that we're seeing and some of the current themes of fear as it relates to immigration. Some of the, it causes some of the smartest people from outside the U.S. and those that are looking to come to the U.S. to question, their, am I really welcome in my own community? Am I welcome to go to a country which previously had offered so much opportunity? Is it a positive environment to live and raise my kids? Do we want to drive away these incredibly talented people and their innovative thinking? Doing so will put our country at a disadvantage. The world's best and brightest may start looking at other countries as their land of opportunity, and that would be profoundly un-American. It would weaken not only our food system, but also the U.S. economy. We have employees in fields like trading and nutrition science, and as a global company, the ability to share insights and collaborate by moving people around the world is absolutely critical to our success. Today, workers from other countries come to Minnesota all the time to grow and share their ex expertise. They contribute positively to the local community here in the Twin Cities, as well as the, to the community. And the H-1B visa program for highly skilled workers makes this possible. It has to be improved to help co companies like ours attract and retain talent. Also, a legal immigration system that works is the best way to address illegal immigration. This means a system that helps employers confirm the identity and work eligibility of the applicants. Cargill only employs people in the U.S. who are legally allowed to work here. But at the same time, we know that agriculture and food manufacturing needs improved visa programs to address labor shortages. This is a complicated issue, but it's one that very un, uh, a lot of different constituencies need to work together, unlikely partnerships, to make it successful. So let me conclude. I consider myself an optimist. I look at the glass half full, and here's the reasons why I think we should be optimistic about the future of food and agriculture in our country and in the world. First of all, the private sector is stepping up. Two weeks ago, I was fortunate enough to be at the World Economic Forum annual meeting in Davos, Switzerland. And in a time of great uncertainty, I saw business leaders, nonprofits, NGOs, and government leaders coming together to say, how can we solve issues like famine, food insecurity, food waste, deforestation, and climate volatility? Cargill and other companies know we have a responsibility to our customers but more importantly, to our communities and to the wider world. I'm also optimistic because I know who we are and I know how far we've come over the last decades and certainly in 151 years of being in business. Companies like General Mills and 3M were born right here on the banks of the Mississippi River. We're people of ingenuity. We're people of resilience. Our hard work has shaped agriculture, food, and nutrition for more than 150 years. Working together, we can continue that ingenuity. 
We can navigate a changing and uncertain landscape, advance innovation, and create policies that will define the next 150 years. Thank you for honoring me with your presence. Thank you for giving me a chance to tell the story, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks.